into that a little bit. The team from Arizona Mission, they did a supply drop, Harvest International Missions 2020, uh, if you could see it in the background. Uh, let's go ahead and go to and flip it. I'll just briefly share this with you. This was at the TLC church, and they put together the care package. And um, it was 100 uh, care package units. And uh, I think, how, how long do you think it would have taken, uh, it would have lasted them, the, the, that food? About a good couple of weeks, right? Maybe even more than a couple of weeks. It was uh, rice, potatoes. Um, it had like package of noodles and beans. Can I do more? What? To Un unmuted or muted? Muted? Oh, I should mute it or unmute it. Muted. Okay. All right. Sorry, folks. Uh, anyway, um, so about go to the next slide. So they prepared it. It, it was about, I think, almost uh, of almost four four thousand five hundred pounds. And so they gathered all that food, and we and they prayed. And then uh, Pastor Charlie and myself, we went there to just help out for a couple hours, a couple three hours. Next slide. And they filled it up uh, in that little trailer that Pastor Mick has, hundred bags of rice. And next. <laughs> and then they headed down in the trailer. And uh, it says right here, bags of rice, 350 pounds of cheese, 350 pounds of meat, and packages containing flour, beans, potatoes, instant noodles, canned goods, breakfast cereal, hand sanitizer, face masks, which actually I think they, um, they handmade like a thousand of them. And Bibles, Gospel of John, uh, gospel tracts, message for each contributing church. So uh, that was that's what they went to dro drop off. Go ahead. And there are going to be some familiar faces. I know a couple of you here have been to AZ, yeah? Okay. So that's the package that's dropped off at one household. Go to the next one. And uh, that's my, one of my favorite guys there, Joseph. Joseph. Uh, he, he's uh, taking a picture with Pastor Steve. Next one. And then we have, I don't know whose household this is, maybe Nisi, I'm not sure. But next, I don't know, I don't know this lady, but next. Who is that? Do you know who this is? Is this? Uh, I don't recognize the person either. Next. Next. That's Penguin. <laughs> Dropping off supplies to the Navajos. Next. A seal, the big guy in the back. Next. They're all, as you can see, they're all wearing their masks. Next. Next. So I get, I'm guessing this is a Cottonwood region. I'm not familiar with this area, but uh, uh, AZ has been in contact with them. So I think this is Boaz. Boaz is uh, dropping off supplies. Next. Next. Uh, they were very appreciative. Next. I actually have like little letters and notes for, from them, but for the, the sake of time, I won't be able to read it. Next. And two. <laughs> distance prevents two sheep apart. Apparently, one sheep is, uh, is like three feet <laughs> long, I guess, full grown. Next. Next. Yeah. And next. Let's just... Uh, Go through it pretty quickly and then get started. Eleanor Smiley and family at the Selene Valley Church. Jasper, Pastor Jasper and Marilyn from Trinity Presbyterian Church, which, by the way, I heard that it got, it got broken into just yesterday and vandalized. A lot of items stolen, uh, quite a lot. Things are getting desperate down there. So next. Uh, Boaz chasing a rabbit. Okay, next. Arizona sunset. And so, special thanks and blessings. And we're mentioned here, Miracle Land Baptist Church, Pastor Lee and Pastor Charlie Koo and congregation. So thank you for your prayers. 
uh, they are thinking about doing another one of these maybe in August. So keep, keep yourself in prayer and then see if the Lord leads you to um, perhaps join. All right, uh, let's go ahead and go to the um, text for today. Today's message is titled, A Church That Cares. If you see in the background of that picture, that's actually uh, an, Indian, an Indian area uh, in Pueblo, Colorado. I thought it was appropriate. Uh, if, you will re- if you'll read the Bible with me, we're going to continue reading our Bible from 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 6-2. I'll read uh, the odd verses, and you'll read the even verses. If you'll all stand with me for the public reading of God's Word. I'm reading from the NIV. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those who work, those whose work is preaching and teaching. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. I charge you, inside of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels, to keep these instructions without partiality and do nothing out of favoritism. Stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. Altogether, verse 2, those who have believing masters should should not show them disrespect just because they are fellow believers. Instead, they should serve them even better because their masters are dear to them as fellow believers and are devoted to the welfare of their slaves. These are the things you are to teach and insist on. This is the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for gathering us this Sunday. Uh, We ask that all of those who are joining us in this physical presence for worship, as well as those who are uh, at home joining us virtually, and also our guests, that we would all together hear your word today. We ask that the messenger would speak your truth with clarity and conviction, and may there be a spiritual anointing. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing before you. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Good afternoon. Wow. Uh, It's what a wonderful privilege it is to share the word with you today. Uh, We're continuing in our first study, uh, the first Timothy study, and uh, we're actually coming to the end of it. I think this is the the penultimate, the the second to last uh, message on on the first book of Timothy. And for a long time, I had overlooked it as like a less important letter. Like if you were to compare it to like Romans, the big giant of letters, or, or Galatians, you know, but uh, it is through our study that I myself am able to access deep, relevant, rich, rich pastoral theology in it. Uh, if you just quickly gloss over this letter, much of it can look like yet another set of uh, to-dos and don't-dos, like a list of, uh, of, of, you know, like a, unlike, not unlike the very law that Paul often places below grace and love, right? But let us be reminded that we are getting schooled on God's love and righteousness through Paul, the former Pharisee par excellence. Paul is someone who knew the Old Testament law, and only after meeting Jesus Christ in person is now able to see into the heart of the Father who gave the law. Paul is probably able to see why God institutes these regulations, But now, as he has to give Timothy some guidelines as he's going to the church in Ephesus, he may be able to gaze even deeper into the heart of our God, the Father. 
Last Sunday, we read uh, Paul telling Timothy to not rebuke an older man harshly, but gently, correct them gently, as if you were treating your own father, and to treat everyone in the church like they were part of your family, like a mother, brothers, and sisters, in absolute purity. And also a good portion of the text last week was dealing with the responsibility of the church for caring for those widows who are truly in need of help. We see that it turns out that the church was called to administer social welfare. So through it all, we're able to see that the heart of God, that the church, uh, uh, we're, through it all, we're able to see that the heart of God, that the church is expected to show, is is the God of, is the God of it is a God who cares. The church should be able to show that God cares about the widows, about the older men, about those people that are in need, right? And just as God is a father who cares, the church is also a body of Christ that cares. If you'll go to the next slide, please, after the uh, passages. In the first section of our text today, we see a category of people who are expected to be cared with honor. In the Greek word, this uh, people uh, that we read as elder today is, is from the Greek presbuteros. Presbuteros, and you'll see the definition there. I don't know if you could read that far, uh, but I'll read it for you, for those of you who might not be able to read it. Presbuteros is a term of rank or office among the Jews, especially members of the great council. These, are, these were people that were called elders, those who are in separate, city, in, in separate cities, manage public affairs or administer justice. So it's a title of position, right? And among Christians, to those who presided over the assemblies, like a pastor, for example. The, the uh, New Testament uses the term bishop, episcope, elders, or presbyters interchangeably. These are interchangeable uh, titles for someone that would be in a position like myself, someone who is presiding over the assembly, right? So although Timothy, in his, uh, he's only in it, how old are you, Timothy. You're 21, so you're way younger than this Timothy, probably. So they're estimating that Timothy of the letter was about in his late 20s or early 30s. And he was expected to administer to the church in Ephesus, carrying himself in a way that the elders could not look down on him for his youth. Paul directs Timothy's attention also to the care of older men, the older widows, and today even to the matter of honoring the elders who teach and who preach. So go to the next slide. You see, um, we being that we're from the Asian culture, we think that honoring those who are older than us is like a, exclusively like an Eastern Confucian ethic. Have you guys ever heard this? That's a Confucian ethic when you, when you unquestiona unquestionably, you just kind of honor the elders. But it's actually a biblical ethic. You look up to the people that have aged. They're venerable because they've gone through more of life than we have. We give them credit for that. The way in which the biblical ethic differs is that while we do assign a respect to our elders, the younger person is expected also to command respect well. That's right. The older person is not to look down on a person simply because they're younger. You said you were 21? I can't look down on you just because you're 21, right? The thing is, to be sure, younger people give plenty of other reasons to be looked down for but not because they're young. If, you know, if, 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 they're not, if they're not being respected by the older people, it's usually because they lack, they're not showing respect, they're not displaying enough respect themselves. In the, Presby in the Presbyterian church where I was ordained in as a pastor, in order to be ordained as an elder, you have to be at least 30 years of age or older with over seven years of impeccable service record acknowledged by the body in the church as a baptized member. So if you were baptized in this church as an, as an adult uh, confirmed person, and then you started serving then, that's when your service would, uh, would begin, the count would begin. And uh, while pastors can be as young as 25, you have to have at least that standing, you know, three decades of life to be able to kind of govern church uh, competently. And, and that's not like a biblical injunction, but it's like just kind of common sense. And as you may have guessed, it is the elders who take part in the governing of the church. And I say take part because 
Who's the head of the church? Those of you who are here, who's the head of the church? Christ is head of the church, right? And so the standard for elders is certainly to be higher. The elders are expected to know Christ better, know the word better, have better spiritual habits and disciplines as prayer, right? So after the selection process and the approval of the session, the group of elders, the candidates for eldership, they go through ordination where the ordaining group of leaders, they lay their hands on their head, on their shoulder, and then they pray to accept them into the ordination, into, into the, the part of the eldership group. Now that may give you some, some clues as to what Paul means to say to Timothy when he says, do not be hasty in laying down your hands. He's saying don't, don't be hasty in making more elders. Watch them closely, be patient. The elders whose work is preaching and teaching nowadays are called what? What do you think they are called nowadays? Elders that preach and teach in the church. Pastor, that's right, Timothy. Thank you. Um, I am, for example, a preaching elder. Paul states that these particular elders who direct the affair of the church, especially if they do it well, they're worthy of double honor. At the risk of making this sound like a self-serving passage, the truth of the matter is that it is already an honor to serve the Lord and function in the church at that capacity. I mean, can you imagine what an honor it is for me every Sunday to deliver the Word of God? I mean, pouring over the, over the passage for the, throughout the week and studying the message so that I could give you, you know, a message that will make an impact in your life spiritually. Then this idea of doubling the honor is referring to someone who would get paid to preach and to teach. So while in the verses uh, last week, the church is called to honor the widows who are in need with support, in our passage today, could Paul have been addressing the issue of maybe Timothy himself getting paid as a teaching and a preaching pastor? Quite possibly. Look at what Paul says in the next verse. Verse 18. For the scripture says... Do not muzzle an ox while, it's treading, while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. I don't know if you understand what that means. If you, if you see an ox, it's a you know, big male, like a, like a bull, right? An animal that is treading the grain, it's working. It's working in the, in the field. And if it's, if it's hungry and it wants to chew some of the cud, if it wants to chew some of the grain, it should be allowed to do so. Not to muzzle, it means to don't, you know, don't put a mask on its face, right? It'd be like uh, if you were like riding, hustling on the bike, and you, you restrict, restrict airflow to your, to your body. There will be the same equivalent effect. Uh, there are some misunderstandings in the church today, and I want to uh, go over these quickly. There are some people, especially those who make some earnings. They may have some substantial earnings, and they think that the pastor or the preaching elder is their employee. I have actually heard people talking like this. I might have overheard them. And, uh, and it shows how they treat their pastors. They act like, I mean, they're, they don't actually say this, but I can almost hear them say it. They say, since I'm giving, you an, giving an offering to the church, and the church is paying you to be a pastor, we get to tell you what to do. Sadly, uh, <laughs> sadly mistaken, because our position that were conferred is precisely to direct and, and direct orders to the, to the church, right? These people have completely removed God from the entire reality of church and those who are in their vocational, vocational calling as clergy. They think it's like an, any ordinary other job. It, it is not. In people who think this way, they do not have an understanding of the value of the Word of God. They don't understand how precious the Word of God is. They don't understand how, how much preparation goes into an average sermon. Church becomes a platform where those who have the money are expected to wield the influence when the contrary is actually the case in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, it is the people that have the wealth are supposed to honor God by serving with the wealth. And this is one of those verses that affirm the value of preaching and teaching within the church. If you remember in Acts 6, Peter saw it fit to raise deacons, servants, for the works of other kinds of service in order that they may dedicate themselves 
to the teaching of the word, the preaching of the word, and in prayer, right? So the first point of our message today, at the risk of it being like a self-serving point, is take care of your elders and by extension, your pastors. Take care of your pastor. How many of you have visited pastor, uh, senior pastor Lee and asked him how he's doing? The last time you heard, he had fourth degree, uh, fourth stage cancer. Have any of you given him a call and asked him, hey, how are you doing? Pastor Charlie told me about how you're recovering and how you're doing. Are you doing better? I mean, don't you think that it would be a, kind of really encouraging if he heard something like that from you guys, from the ESV? I certainly think so. I was talking to a, a pastor just last year, and he planted his own church, and he was having difficulties in subsistence economy because they were moving towards financial independence. They were, they were you know, sharing space with another church, but they were moving away from that. They were trying to become an autonomous church. And their budget was especially tight because, and the, the stipend that the pastor was receiving was very low. It was very little. And he was putting in overtime and he was getting, you know, and he was getting by on part-time wages. And by the time the church, by the time, you know, time passed, some years passed, and the church grew, and the budget became more plentiful. And, uh, and when the pastor called, you know, he, I think that he thought that it was appropriate to ask for maybe a raise. And a few of the members of his congregations, he could not, they could not simply understand why he was petitioning for a raise of his stipend. That's the question that I want to ask you guys. Like, I, we're, not, we're not there. We're not very close. We're not even close there. But let's say that we become an autonomous body. Let's say we become a multi-ethnic uh, congregation. We have a lot of people. We become a sizable group. How would you want your pastors to be compensated? That kind of tells you, that kind of tells you in your own heart where you value the whole, uh, whole thing that we do here together as in worship, as in hearing the word of God. Do you value it as the precious treasures that you have at home, as the things that you treasure in your own life? I think that um, it will really speak volumes, at this, again, at this uh, risk of sounding self, self-serving. When the church is able to honor and take care of their pastors, they're affirming value to their service, and in the end, honoring the very principle that we see Paul point out to Timothy. For example, when a guest speaker comes to our church and preaches a message, the speaker is honored with an honorarium. Have you guys ever heard of that term? Honorarium is a stipend that is assigned for the guest speaker who comes, and you honor them with that. It's not a new trend that preaching pastors uh, often hold down additional jobs to sustain a living wage income. Paul himself was a tent maker uh, in his missionary works. And I know a pastor down in Florida who had to supplement his living wage by driving Uber. And praise God that recently he got a position as a chaplain in the sheriff's department in order to keep the church going where they, where they cannot aff- afford to give him to pay him a living wage. Just the other day, I met, a, I met a, just by chance really, I met a pastor of 30 years who before his pastor, he worked for a telephone company. But he quit his job, and he started his own tele- telecommunication company. And at the same time, he planned the church out there in Riverside. There are many bivocational pastors, and in his case, it was by his choice. But Paul is calling for those who are called into the exclusive service of church office to be compensated. To be compensated. In an ideal world, every pastor serving in a medium-sized church should be able to earn a living wage But as it is, most part-time pastors have to find additional work to supplement their income. This is a part of reality. The point is, take care of your elders and your pastors. Take care of those who are in service of the church. From the KSC, we have an ordained deacon. He's equivalent to the biblical elder that we're discussing today from the text. After each Sunday, after each Sunday service, he puts on a full body suit he mixes a sterilizing solution, and then he puts the uh, sprayer, he pumps the sprayer, and then he, he sanitizes the whole building. He does that. He's expe- expected to do that every Sunday. How could we take care of that particular elder? 
for one thing, we could chip in and not expect him to be the sole person to, sole volunteer to take on a, such a task. If the first way in which the church, is, church can take care of the elder is through monetary compensation, an example I just bring to your attention today is to assist them, to be helpful to the elders that are, that are leading and governing the church, to be helpful to someone like me. If, if I'm asking for you guys to show up, like the praise team, and you guys said, yeah, okay, and you showed up, that is a huge assistance uh, to, to me in, my, in the ministry that we're doing together, right? Now, uh, in the verse that follows, Paul lays down some guidelines in how to keep them accountable. Because what happens, we're talking about eldership. There are people that are kind of above, above, they're in a higher position, right? It is really a terrible thing that we see sometimes when a person is given a role in a higher position in status, like an elder or a senior pastor, they think that they are automatically beyond reproach. Just because they're in a position, nobody can touch me, right? Of course, in the house church system, which seems more egalitarian, everything's more equal, but I want you to make no mistake about it. Whether it's a house church in the church system, where a system of, uh, where God ministers to people through the system of authority, there is a hierarchy. There are people that are above you that I answer to. I answer to Pastor Lee, right? And hierarchy does not automatically mean oppression. Just because you have a boss that is paying you, does that mean it's oppressive? We sometimes make that mistake. I want you guys to clear that out of your mind. I often place myself in the senior pastor's shoes, and I can't imagine the pressure that he has to face when he has to answer to the Lord. He is the person that he has to answer, that has to answer to the Lord when something really big happens in the church. In fact, I am glad that I answered to Pastor Lee the final respons responsibility of many things on the church uh, affairs, it falls on his shoulders. Can you go to the next slide? Okay. Now, let us suppose that there is an elder in the church who is practices in regular, ordinary, daily living or in business practices. They're shady and they're clearly unethical. They may be within the legal boundaries, but they're sinning. Let's say that that's, what's hap that's what happens. Paul's language discourages bringing in an accusation. Don't even think about it unless is how I read it. They are expected to be confronted, however. They are expected to be confronted with caution and absolute certainty. Verse 19, do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. So if they are in fact found to be out of line by two or more uh, witnesses, whatever impropriety it may be, whatever sin it may be that they are caught in, they are to be corrected in front of everyone. Paul says, this is in order that others may take warning. It seems a little harsh, right? Public rebuke, but that's what it says in the, in the Bible, in Proverbs. Better is an open rebuke than hidden love, right? The purpose of the correction is so that the, they might be able to find a way to repent. If they don't see the seriousness of what they're doing wrong, and if the public response is not elicited, they might think that it's okay to continue on that way. Will they be able to repent? If you remember from Acts, Ananias and Sapphira, <laughs> they didn't even get a chance to repent. They had actually given, all they did wrong is they gave, a, they gave an incomplete offering. And they passed it as a full offering. And this couple, they were struck dead one after the other. Ananias first, and then Sapphira next. What Luke points out after this had happened in the book of Acts is that great fear seized the, the whole church and all who heard about these events. It's not a new concept to make public rebuke an example for many. And the general loss of this fear is a great catastrophe in the minds of many Christians who take their Christian life and faith way too casually. Way too casually. They take, they take sin very casually. Sometimes we think, oh, it's not hurting anybody, so it's okay. But it does damage the body, the reputation of the body. When we address God through Jesus Christ, we are addressing a person whose holiness demanded the sacrifice 
of His Son. He is the Holy Father who created the heavens and the earth by speaking them into existence out of nothing, ex nihilo. And since the advent of technology and, and tele-evangelism, I don't know if you guys are familiar with tele-evangelists. You guys are all like post-TV generation, so maybe you don't know them. Everything is like YouTube nowadays, but back in, the, back in the days when people used to watch TV, right? Prominent Christian leaders have increasingly become public figures. They became popular and famous, and with that kind of exposure, some have become really, really big. And uh, we have also seen some of them taking pretty big falls. And this is even before many of you were born, but uh, during the late 80s and early 90s, a couple of pastors were found guilty in their moral failures of sexual sin as well as embezzlement of money. And it was a shocking news where man who delivered the word of God comes to public disrepute. You see, the problem is that the individual failures, it's not, it doesn't only affect me, it affects the whole body. When I was in middle school, I remember watching the news and thinking, geez, this can't be good. I wasn't even attending church at the time. I, 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 I didn't feel that was a good thing. And I won't mention any names, but from the two people that I'm mentioning from, the, from that decade, one of them returned to his own radio and television program doing Bible studies. Uh, you would think that after a hard fall like that, they would not be able to come back. They would just, just uh, disappear into obscurity, but this person is back in, in active ministry. And as far as I can tell you, this is a testimony of far more than a man sticking to his calling and making a comeback. This speaks volumes to the extent of God's forgiveness, and God's forgiveness that was evident was made evident by the church that care about this particular preaching and teaching elder. They care about him so much that they allowed him to come back into ministry. They restored him. If his church did not care about him, there would have been no way for that pastor to recover into ministry. Over 10 years had to pass for this pastor to come back into ministry, but there was a church that knowing very well the mistake that he made, actually not even once, more than on one occasion he made these mistakes, but they forgave him and he restored him. So the roles and the positions of status, if you see people that are in higher positions, they are to serve as signs. If they do well, great. But if they fall, it is a warning sign for many others. The higher the honor due to the person, also heavier the responsibility and more severe the punishment in the event of a mistake. Verse 21, I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and do nothing out of favoritism. How many of you have no favoritism at all? You guys can say comfortably that when it comes to dealing with people, I'm totally impartial. This is a lot harder than it sounds. A lot harder than it sounds. When I was younger, I used to pride myself in my own ability to be objective with people. You know, I would like make objective standards, you know, I would make a rubric and a criteria. Like when you're grading somebody, when you have a teacher, when you are a teacher, you have, you have your favorites, but you can't give them a grade, like a better grade than the other, other students because you like them better, right? It's like that. As a human person, there's always some people that you just get along with better. But suppose that there's a dispute between a couple of elders. One let's say that has more wealth and influence, more popular, more powerful elder, and the, uh, the other elder is in all those respects weaker. Would you be able to maintain objectivity and not be swayed to some bias? If, the, if you're strong about that, if you're strong about that per personal ethic, it's usually a personal bias. If I was in a multicultural church and I happened to favor the African-American elder, over the Native American elder because of the public attention that the black race is getting currently in the media, that would be kind of an unacceptable partiality. In the, in before, before God, that would, not, that would not carry at all. God does not take partiality in race, in socioeconomic status, your level of education, your level of attractiveness, uh, even your background, even your past. You could, have, uh, you could have made some mistakes in your past, but he does not. 
he will not count that towards you or against you. The only thing that he may favor over the other thing is your heart and your obedience. That's for, that's for sure, right? If you're being disobedient, do you think that he's going to favor that? No. You're going to feel the distance when you're being disobedient. But as long as, insofar as you're being uh, submissive to, the, to God's will, then of course you're going you're gonna to have access to whatever he wants to bestow you. All the blessings will be before you. So watch your attitude, okay? I wish that uh, my YouTube guys could, my Zoom guys could see my face, but watch, watch your attitude when it comes to church. Verse 22, do not be hasty in, hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. One of the commentators I, uh, I, 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 I uh, researched for the message, Bill Mounds, he says that this is about commissioning an elder, laying down of hands. Quote, whether it be a new elder or one that was caught in sin and repented, to not do so quickly. The danger is that Timothy could share in their sin. Verse 24, 25 adds that the sins of some and the good works of others are not readily apparent. Patience is therefore important, giving the sins and the good works time to surface and hence avoid sharing in sins, end quote. It took, remember I told you it took over 10 years for that pastor that had, the, had made the, his sin public? He, it took 10 years for him to, to, to prove his repentance. The people had to see, did you really repent? You know, and after 10 years, he was restored back into God's service. Which leads to the second point of today's message. Take care of yourself. This may, be a, this may sound like a counterintuitive because you know, the world says look out for number one, which is yourself, right? In the Christian ethos is God first, other second, you last, right? But this is not what it's, it's not talking about like a, um, looking after yourself in the sense of, you know, uh, grab what you can for yourself. That's not what we're talking about. This idea of not sharing in the sins of others and to keep myself pure, this is actually in the category of self-care, caring myself. Uh, when you have a friend that you love, you might say something like, hey, take care of yourself. How many of you ever heard that from a friend that loves you? From family member or friend from, yeah, somebody says, hey, take care of yourself. That's coming, that's coming from someone, from love. There's a, it's a friendly reminder from Paul to Timothy. Self-care is one of those things that were emphasized when I entered seminary. Many discipleship pastors or other counseling type of pastors, they talk about soul care. Taking care of your soul, of your own soul. I used to think, uh, God will take care of me. I don't have to look out for myself at all. I actually believe that. But it turns out that th that kind of attitude is not unlike, you know the three the temptations of Christ where, where Satan takes Jesus to the top of the high place and says, hey, if you really are the son of God, throw yourself down and not a hair will be, not a hair from, will, will be hurt from your head, right? Um, that kind of a recklessness is not self-care or it's not even, that's not really, net, it's not faith to, to think of it that way. I didn't understand what self-care was back then, but now I realize that it is about maintaining your walk with God and to really be awake and alert to His presence. Because if you know that God is there, and if you know that your actions can damage the reputation of God or His church, then you would think twice before you did some of the things that you do. I have heard it preached that a sleeping Christian actually does more harm than an unbeliever. Do you guys believe this? I think it's absolutely possible. If you're a sleeping Christian then you're spiritually attuned to some other things than God himself. Listen to what Paul tells Timothy. Verse 23. This is kind of a, one of those eyebrow-raising passages, but verse 23, stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. Was Timothy a person that is in good health? Apparently from this particular verse, not really. I don't know what kind of a stomach ailment that he had, but I don't know. Uh, this is the only place in the Bible where an older apostle tells his spiritual son to not only drink water but have a little wine. This is the same Paul, mind you, who said in Romans 14, 21, 
It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. Verse 22, so whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. Paul is not contradicting himself or being partial to Timothy in his teaching. You know what he's advocating is self-care. Take care of yourself. It's an interesting thing that this verse is sandwiched right between Paul's exhortation regarding not sharing in the sins of others because logically speaking then, it is possible for Timothy to have a little wine and still keep himself pure. For some, it is possible to use a little wine with your dinner, to have a little wine as a part of your meal, whereas for others, it will become an issue of self-control. And for some, it's a surefire way into debauchery, madness, and maybe even death. So in context of that then, let's see how the next couple of verses read. Verses 24 uh, and 25. The sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those who are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. Which is actually good news for these people that are doing good. If you feel like you're serving the church and you're doing a good job and nobody's giving you credit, one day you will be recognized. God himself will lift you up and say, this has been my person all this time, working in toiling away in obscurity when nobody was watching. That's what you want. You want the approval to come from God. You don't want people to say, you know what Jesus says, woe to you if people speak well of you, right? If people have, could have all kinds of misunderstandings about, about you, but uh, when you are being faithful, when nobody's watching, then you know that God has commendations ready for you and definitely rewards up in heaven. Just so that you may be able to understand properly the spirit of what Paul is saying, it is comparable to when I say to my wife, when I tell her, my wife, when she works, man, it's, it's almost scary. Everything, she's able to zone, get in the zone and tune everything out. And for long hours, she's able to work. The way she works is almost like when I go on these long bike rides. So it's like me telling her, honey, uh, take a little break. Don't forget to take a little break. Put a little timer on yourself so you could go for a walk, you know. It's that kind of take care of yourself kind of a, a message. Uh, I used to make a point back in the days that this verse was about Paul's approval of drinking alcohol, but it's really about minding your body and taking care of yourself. Back in the days, Regular water was far less than drinkable than the fermented stuff. Even when, like 15 centuries later, in Germany, Martin Luther uh, openly praised their beer. You know, he talked about the Wittenberg beer, how it's superior to the other beers. But uh, uh, the potable water during that time was potentially dangerous to drink. These days, you can drink your tap water. Did you guys know you could drink your tap water? How many of you have drank tap water? Raise your hands if you ever drank your tap water out of the tap. You never have? I have. I never got sick once. American tap water is pretty safe. Even in Arizona, where it tastes a little salty, I still didn't get, I still didn't get sick. The whole thread of thought is actually talking about patience. Timothy, take care of yourself. Be patient. Don't rush into things. Um, he is to watch the people before laying hands on them. And back in the days... I want you to know that the early church fathers, right after the times of the New Testament period, even baptism was, was done, not done hastily. People took their time with baptism. There was a whole ca uh, um, um, catechism. It's a pre-catechism kind of a training, which was uh, known as the Didache, the Lord's teaching through the 12 apostles to the nations. And they were expected to know these teachings that Jesus taught before the public confession of faith made in the immersion baptism. So, being patient, judicious, and impartial, these are all ways of a leader that in the end can be conducive to longevity in ministry. The pastor that called me into service, uh, Pastor Huang, he, he, he always told, me, told us, when we're, whenever we're having a staff meeting, he would say, I want you to remember, ministry is a marathon, not a sprint. You got to go the long haul. You have to finish well, right? Not fall in, in the middle. And not only for a pastor, but even a lay shepherd 
who is able to watch himself in that way, I'm speaking to you guys, uh, Adam and Eric, shepherds, uh, watch yourself in that way, and you should be able to make your stretch to the finish line. Um, whenever, whenever we go to uh, uh, New Life, you ask, you ask their shepherds, well, how long are you going to do this? They don't say, oh, until my retirement age when I'm 65. They go, what do you mean, how long are we going to do this? We're going to do this until we die, right? So uh, now we turn our attention to the next chapter, uh, verse six, verse, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. All who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. So the third point of our message today is, if you go to the next slide, uh, take care of your masters. During this day and age, it's kind of a, it kind of hits a nerve, this, this, this kind of verses, people, there's allergies to these kind of verses because many, many white Christians of America's history's past have proof texted these verses as reasons to believe that slavery was God-ordained that God had instituted the institute of slavery. But let's not make a mistake about this. Uh, this is addressing the culture of that time. The name of God and the teaching of the gospel not being slandered is the, of the same God who saw it fit to liberate the Hebrews out of Egypt. How much did he see this fit? He saw it fit to liberate the Hebrews out of Egypt to go as far as to striking dead every firstborn, both human and animal. That's how much he prized the freedom of his worshipers. So God then is not a God of slavery, but of freedom. Paul says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. That's in Galatians 1, right? The priority and concern is then for the reputation of the Christian way. Paul doesn't want the, the Christian way to come to disrepute because of our behaviors. For every slave who was owned by their masters to consider them worthy of respect. It isn't because they're deserving of it already. I can already think of many, many slave masters that were not deserving of any respect. But it is a consideration that keeps God in mind and in the picture. Let me say it this way. If you choose to respect your boss, it is because you honor God first. You honor God and you are thankful that you even have a job to begin with. Now these days, the idea of slave-master relationship is not really hard to, it's not really, it's not really hard to trace. Uh, sometimes it's been called a wage slave. I don't know if you would agree, but every, if you have an entry-level job of any kind, for the time that they're paying you on the clock, your entire being is at their disposal. For that hour that they're paying you, you have to be there fully present. You are obligated to, to your full employable presence during that time. But as you work, you may find there are supervisors who may be even less competent than you. I don't know if you've ever uh, come across that, and I don't know how patient you, you may be in those kinds of situations. You may have managers that quite obviously are not even doing their own job. For a variety of reasons, you may not like your boss, but if you fail to give proper respect to the person who is in a position above yours, you're missing God as the author, the ultimate author of reality. If the person is doing a bad job, it will, be, it will come. Whatever is due, it will be coming to them, especially if it's a negligence and, and a perp like a deliberate, deliberate uh, um, irresponsibility. You are dismissing God's infinite knowledge of every person's individual circumstances and limitations and even perhaps their impending judgment. So if somebody is doing bad, don't fret. Just give them still the respect that they are deserving because they're in the, in the position of the organization, whatever job it may be. It could be in the church too. But if you see God first in every relationship you encounter in life, your primary interest becomes God's reputation as well as the church's reputation. The reputation of your own elders, the reputation of your pastor. It's like a family who cares about how each member is perceived from the outside. I care about how people see my wife. 
how people see my children. I love it when they get praises, you know, just uh, uh, whenever, whenever I hear my son and my daughter praised by other parents, man, we both delight in that. They, we, it's awesome. And, and I am certain that my wife cares about how people see me. That is why, even though I may be hard to respect many times, my wife still ex- extends and guards that respect for me. I don't know if I should say this from the pulpit, but not just recently. I've been having trouble with gas. I've been, you know, just uh, letting the gas come out a lot, you know. But, but my wife doesn't, she doesn't, she doesn't openly complain about this. She just, I mean, she'll, between the two of us, she might in a bedroom talk, she might say, that's gross. But, but uh, she doesn't openly, um, she doesn't openly, uh, what do you call it? Take away my dignity in front of other people. There's, there's a kind of a guarding of, of the respect that she does in public, which I really appreciate, and I praise her for today. Now, I'm the one that smeared <laughs> the shame on myself, but um, be that as it may. In any case, master and slave, employer-employee dynamics, your relationship to your boss becomes sometimes a one of opportunity, especially if you have a boss that doesn't believe. If you have an unbelieving boss, every bad thing that you may endure from your boss can potentially be turned to his glory because you've endured it. And when Christ finally touches his or her heart, your boss's heart, then hallelujah. It will be because you did not complain. It's because you extended the respect and you were there faithful to your calling as his child. Amen? All right. That is why... Even though I may be hard to respect, my wife extends uh, that and guards that respect for me. Um, The early church was one of those unique areas where both masters and slaves could be part of the same institution, in the same body, as as the same part of the family. Verse 2, those who have believing masters should not show them disrespect just because they are fellow believers. You know, you guys know how like... uh, in house church, you guys get all giggly and you guys do the roasting. Roasting, right? That's a little bit too familiar. When you're really familiar with each other, you, you get kind of coarse with each other and you joke around. Like if, you, if a newcomer comes into that, they might feel like, like an outsider, right? You know? Uh, right now, what, what Paul is talking about is if you have a master and slave enjoying the same kind of camaraderie, to not disrespect them just because they have become close as a part of the family. Uh, My wife says this a lot. She says, uh, uh, the more you know a person, the more you should, uh, how how did you say it? It's like uh, you you shouldn't be so familiar that it's easy to be like uh, coarse joking, you know, joking around and uh, denigrating the person. The jokes should be still respectful. You, still, you should still, the longer you know the person, you should still be able to, to, to respect them. But the tendency is when we get close, we like to let our guards down and I start poking each, at each other, right? I mean, all in the name of fun, we lose a lot of things because uh, when you show disrespect in one way or another, it damages the relationship. It puts a strain in it. And, so, and one day, one person gets a little too hurt because you went over the line. And then what happens, right? So... Being, being cordial is, is very important. Instead, it says, they should serve them even better because their masters are dear to them as fellow believers and are devoted to the welfare of their slaves. These are the things you are to teach and insist on. Have you guys ever heard of this term? Familiarity breeds contempt. Ever heard that expression? You guys know what that means? It means when you become really close, like let's say you got really close with your boss. Let's say that you went to too many work parties, like you went to the New Year's party and you, you caught your boss having one, one too many glasses of wine or one too many jokes, okay? You, you started joking about each other and then you joked about his wife and boom, you drew the, the line was crossed, right? I find that this can happen uh, would it be weird for a boss and his employee to attend and be part of the same church? This is what it was back in the days, except that we're talking about not bosses and employees. We're talking about masters and slaves. The big difference is that the slaves were property. They were owned, they were owned by their masters. 
this relationship between two people, kind of hard to understand in this day and age, but because slaves can't just leave, uh, they can't just leave. As much as their masters need them, they need their masters for survival. When the master took them into their household, it was like uh, uh, they were also taken care of by their masters. That's how the, 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 the relationship was. It, was. it was a kind of a give and take relationship. Not the way we think of slavery today, as it happened in, in, the, in American history. But back in those biblical times, it was, a, it was an institution that was uh, far different from what we are used to and, and know from movies. Paul calls for slaves to respect their masters and for their masters to be devoted to the welfare of their slaves. Now the language almost sounds like a father being devoted to the welfare of their children. If this person is in my household, that person is under my care, right? In the church, as far as Paul was speaking of the different categories of people, widows, elders, slaves, they were all expected to be treated with dignity, respect, honor. In other words, the church is the body that cared for one another. And since our passage ends on slaves and masters, let me end on this story. It's a short story, one of Onesimus and Philemon. Philemon is the third shortest document in the Bible. It's only 335 words. Where Paul writes to Philemon, the owner of the slave, who ran away. When you look at the, when you study that letter a little bit, there's some clues that, that this might have happened. Onesimus, the, the slave, he might have actually even stolen some property. In order for him to make the journey, in order for him to escape as far away from his master as possible, he might have actually stolen something. And in this letter, Paul asks Philemon to take him back because Paul had already convinced him to return. If you can imagine telling a runaway slave, hey, look, listen, go, go back to your master, okay? Go back to your master. Look at how much the Lord has done for you. Go back to your master. And then he's writing this letter, and in his letter he says, take him back. Take him back, but not as a slave, but as a brother. If a person goes back to his master willingly, hasn't he ex exercised his own freedom to do so? That person went back willingly, right? When Paul says in Galatians 3.28 that there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, nor male, and female, it is because we are one in Christ Jesus. We were all deemed as precious, so much so that he died for each of us, from the highest echelons of society down to the, the Dalits, as a term for the Hindu caste system, the untouchables. The top to the top of the top, to the, the bottom of the bottom of a barrel, God died for each and every soul in that way. There is no one so high and no one so low to whom the love of God could not reach because Jesus Christ brings it down to this one fact. He died for us. I, myself, and any person next to me. He died for each and every one of us that way because of love. That's how much he cared. So that's why in the church we're expected to show that we care so that we care about the reputation of the church, reputation of the members of the people. That's why, that's the, one of the guards of us fighting for his righteousness and against him. Amen? Let it be a week where we're able to taste the love of God and to let that love be lived out in the little tiny things that you do, uh, in the people around you. Amen? Okay, let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your message today as we approach the end of uh, uh, 1 Timothy. Lord, it's a short letter, but it, is, it packs a lot of uh, great wisdom and, and uh, practical teachings towards a holy living and governing the church well. Lord, in, in so many of the ways that I lack and uh, so much of the challenge that's issued from the text, we ask that we would internalize it as we put into practice in our daily ways. And that you would, in your spirit, exhort us to contact each other, uh, to, um, to pray for one another ceaselessly, 
and to let the people know that we care. All the individual things that we may be going through, that God cares, that we would be signs of this caring. Lord, uh, help us that we would be able to fulfill this function well, and in all the areas we may lack, we ask that your Spirit would pour your anointing upon us. We pray all of this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now at this time, we have a time of uh, praise and response offering, and then praise and response. response prayer of praise and then offering.
this time of a time of offering. You may do your giving through Venmo. And if you're visiting, please don't feel obligated to give. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for gathering us here during this uh, summer vacation for many of the college people and uh, um, for those of us who are working, Lord, uh, help us see that it is you that has given us the energy uh, and the opportunity to, to do any productive labor under the sun. whenever we're able to rest, whenever we're able to do our work, may we do it all for your glory. We ask that all the resources that are gathered may be used to uh, supplement those areas of need like it was given to, to Arizona, to places that are in need in the church, that we would, Lord, uh, uh, busily uh, search out for those people that are truly in need and to help. Lord, we ask that Uh, in your mission that your name will be proclaimed and that uh, your your church would continue to thrive out in the world Um, we ask Lord that uh, your name and your church would be um, your name will be glorified forever and that the church would be a, a living and active sign of you dealing with the world uh, continually uh, may many more souls be saved Uh, through the work of this ministry. I will pray this, all of this in Jesus' mighty name. We're going to con- conclude uh, today's service with the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who places all the appointed officers um, in His church uh, according to His liking and His purpose, and the love of God the Father that allows for imperfect human beings to to. to carry out his ministry and the love of uh, the Holy Spirit, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that binds us all together as one, whether we are in the top positions or in the bottom positions, whether we may be male or female, slaves or free, be with you all now and forever. Amen. Thank you. That concludes our service for today. Go in peace.